So um, we're here to here to hear from Dan. And if you if you don't know Dan, and, and the range of, of people and in interests here is absolutely astounding, and uh, I think it's a testimony to um, to Dan and his interests and what he's going to be talking about today. If you don't know Dan, um, uh, this is a wonderful opportunity to get to know you a little bit. Um, I know knew Dan first uh, as a reader of his really influential and important column in the San Jose uh, Mercury News. Well, a while ago, where Dan was one of the earliest and most incisive and trustworthy uh, commentators on the tech scene, uh, really uh, central to to forming many of our understandings of what was going on. Dan has gone on he, um, to write, ahead of his time, leading, I think uh, it's safe to say, discussions about the involvement of readers with journalists, uh, civics and, and journalism, um, a very broad range of, of intersections that Dan is is at. He's um, currently uh, the founding director of the Knight Center for Digital Media Entrepreneurship um, at Arizona, Arizona State University's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Um, and uh, it's been one of the great pleasures of my life that over the past few years we've actually, I've gotten no Dan beyond uh, his, his print. <laughs> so um, I will leave you to introduce your topic and, um, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, thanks. Um, okay. A technology issue. Um, I played music when I was a lot younger and am getting fairly deaf. Um, and I wear hearing aids, and one of the, the battery in one of them just died. So, uh, when you ask questions, which we will do as quickly as I can get to them, uh, please like speak up because otherwise I'll have to get David to interpret them for me, which wouldn't be fun. Um, Thank you for that, uh, and I say as well that David Weinberger is one of my heroes in life, and uh, it's a, a joy to know him. Um, so let's jump right in. I'm, uh, this is a little bit like something I did here uh, a few years ago. I was working on a, a, a book, getting just going on it, and uh, wanted to sound out this incredible crowd about where I thought I was heading and uh, basically pick the collective brain in this room and think about and, and, and figuring, as always, that there's a lot more knowledge and brains in here than uh, I can provide that I, I, it would really help me think it through. And people were great and gave me great ideas. So I'm counting on that happening today. The new project, uh, I want to, before I even start, say that this really starts from uh, two in particular books that are influential for me. One is Jonathan Zittrain's uh, The Future of the Internet and How to Prevent It. I think that's the full title. How to Stop It. Um, yeah, better word. Um, and uh, where he talks about generativity and, and the lockdown of devices. And Rebecca McKinnon's The Consent of the, Go of the Network. Um, and I think they've both framed some issues brilliantly. You should read their books. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of starting with that and, and trying to go further, and I'll, I'll get back to that in a minute. I'm thinking again about these issues of uh, lock-in and, and the, the trade-offs that we're making for convenience versus freedom and security, et cetera. And we really are in a world of trade-offs, and I don't want to minimize that. You, uh, we, we, in the earlier days, I think, of computing and the internet, that the convenience and freedom kind of overlapped because the stuff wasn't that easy to use. Um, so it was relatively inconvenient, but relatively free. Um, and I, I think we've drifted kind of in a bad way for lots of good reasons to something like this. And, you know, I could add a lot more circles and make this more complicated, but but you get the idea. This is early thinking, and I, I thank David for the idea of the the crude Venn diagram as as a way of uh, helping to explain this. And I'll you know just I'm going to just go through some of the crap that's going on uh, in slides and show you you know it's it's pretty horrible uh, parade of horribles here of what what we're doing. Um, you know, it, and it's companies, it's governments, it's, you know, a whole bunch of people. Uh, 
you know, you go on. This was this one struck me. This is some years ago. Uh, a uh, Loic Lemur is a uh, entrepreneur, and I, when he tweeted this once, I thought, "Wow, that's really interesting." And in a way, it's becoming true. And it, you know, that raises questions about well, then maybe there are utility. And we, what do we do with utilities if we have any sense? We regulate them. Monopolies need regulation. I'm not really a fan of regulation, by the way, but we have to think about that. Um, you know, on and on the horribles continue. Um, th this is I want. This is the permissions for a single application that you give up on on Android. At least they tell you. I'm that's screen two, screen three. It actually goes longer than this. That's the things you let this application do, uh, which is to say everything. Your phone becomes theirs. Same with your screen line. That was pretty scary. Uh, and uh, by the way, the application in, I'm referring to here is Skype for Android, owned by Microsoft. Interesting. Um, an, another recent one, uh, you know, eBay has always been a control freak, but this is ridiculous. Um, and, and Bruce Schneier, whose work you should all follow in, this, in the area of security, has framed it quite well that we're, we're heading toward feudalism and security, but actually in a lot of things that's true, not just security. Uh, you know, so this goes on and on and on. By the way, I've never assumed that Skype did not have a back door because they've never answered the question, even when it was run by uh, the founders in Estonia. They, they never would answer the question in a direct way. They said, it's secure. Yeah, thank you. But, and, and you couldn't, the, the lack of answer to that question was the answer. And of course, now that Microsoft owns it, you should just assume whether or not it's true. You should just assume there's a back door for the feds and whoever else. So, that, that, so that's my little, you know, biz, you know, one millionth of the problem that you just saw. And it's, and it's, it's getting more so the lock in the, the platform stuff. And again, we do this partly for convenience. I use a Kindle or Kindle app anyway. I, I use a lot of the stuff that locks me in. It makes me worry, but I, I can't avoid it at some level. And we, we, we make choices. And, and the, you know, these questions that we have to ask are pretty obvious ones, and especially the people in this room, I think, know all these are things that, that we must think about if we're going to be uh, you know, digitally literate in, in the world that we're in. And you know there there are things that you know that happen that make me feel better at least for a minute or two. Blocking SOPA was one, but keep in mind that you know the the, the copyright cartel is a uh, well-funded, uh, smart group of people who never quit. They will keep sneaking stuff into law however they can. They're they're going to come after it again and again, and I expect the people on the side of uh, not getting screwed are going to, you know, keep fighting it, and it's going to be, I hope, just a standoff. And we obviously need better laws, and we need better regulations, we need better rules. I don't dispute that. And and a lot of what Jay Z and Rebecca have talked about is, in the in the policy arena, which is key, crucial. I, and I'm uh, I'm planning to address that to a little extent in this new project, but. I don't think it's enough. I think we have to take some responsibility ourselves in this uh, to the extent, again, that we choose to. I'm, I'm not going to tell everyone to do it my way, uh, but I'm going to say at least I think that there are some things we can do. And today's thing, I have a lot of other things <laughs> I'm working on for this project, but I want to just focus in a minute uh, on, on the security and, and countermeasures side of it, which are not enough, by the way. I've got to re repeat that. It's not enough. Um, and, and then I want to kind of hear what you all think I should be, what I, you know, things I'm missing and what I could uh, include in this. So it'll range from the very simple. I'm, I'm, again, I'm, this book is not going to be aimed book or something. I'm not even sure it's a book. It's aimed at people uh, not like the super digitally smart 
crowd here, but regular folks um, who uh, need to actually hear stuff like, you know, when the saw, when the update shows up, install it. Um, again, things that one of the most important security things on any computer, if if we can assume that they're remotely secure to begin with. Um, full disk encryption. I I think that should be the default. It's it's not. Microsoft charges extra for it. Um, it it's a, Apple makes it a lot easier. Ubuntu, it's now relatively easy. And on most Linux installations, Ubuntu, Ubuntu makes it quite easy. What was that? Um, oh. Um, um, things like extensions in our browsers that, that will lock some stuff down. Um, I experiment widely with those, and uh, to the point that a lot of sites that I use get really uh, upset and don't work right because I'm blocking their spying on me and or their enabling of third party spies on me for the most part. Um, I, I've, I've rooted my phone, of course, uh, and have an app that actually will block specific permissions within the app. So uh, Angry Birds wants to do a lot of stuff that I don't want it to do. Well, so I can just block those permissions. Now, in some cases, when they see that you're blocking their ability to track you everywhere on the planet, they'll say, sorry, I'm not going to work. I'll make that trade. That's fine. I, I, that's, I'm, what I don't like is having to accept these permissions or not use it. It's sort of all or nothing. That's the world we live in is, you know, long agreements that you click through that give you zero <laughs> rights and the vendor all the rights. Uh, this is a countermeasure. It's not perfect, but it's better than nothing. You know, Tor, using uh, some of the stuff that people are doing like this that uh, I think is interesting. Incidentally, if the CIA is not running or the NSA is not running a lot of the exit nodes on <laughs> Tor, I'd be really surprised. I would assume that some of the exit nodes are being run by the bad guys or the good guys, depending on your frame of mind. And, and by the way, some of the exit nodes are undoubtedly being run by criminals. Think about that. We have, you know, there's no perfect thing. That's why a lot of, I think lots more people should be Tor relays and exit nodes. We should try to make that a uh, very common thing. Could you, so, uh, sorry, could you explain that that Tor thing? Yeah, what it is. It, it's the, the onion router. It basically, it's a, I, I won't get into the technical details, but basically it's a way of, uh, of browsing the web. You shouldn't do it for much more than that. Uh, with uh, some reason, some reasonable uh, likelihood that your ISP doesn't know what you're actually looking at, and what you're looking at doesn't know where you're coming from. Does that capsulize it? Um, and you know, this is a valuable thing for uh, you know, it's it's not just people who want to do bad stuff or or who want to watch porn, but for people who need some security for whistleblowing and a lot of other things. This is, uh, th there's real reasons to use Tor um, that are incredibly important and uh, we need more of this kind of thing. Um, I, I got well over a decade ago when the supermar supermarket loyalty cards first started coming out. A bunch of friends and I used to get together <laughs> once a month and put them all in a hat, shake the hat, and then we'd each pick one out. It was not ours if we were, you know, the odds were we wouldn't pick out our own. If we did, we'd trade it. And the, the purpose was obvious, which was to make the data useless. Now, the, the loyalty supermarket stuff, they've, they've gotten wise to this, and they've stopped really insisting on, you know, you telling the truth. Um, when you sign up for it, in fact, the last time I got one, I gave my address as 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, Washington, D.C., and the guy looked up and said, yeah, it's amazing how many people live there. <laughs> <laughs> and so they're in on the joke, right? But 
they've also, the, the thing about that that kind of troubles me is that if I do that with a supermarket loyalty card, the absolute worst thing that can happen is they'll say, you can't use it. You do that online, according to the Obama Justice Department, you have just committed a felony. That's a policy we need to fix. And I read this morning from someone I trust that, uh, in fact, the, late, the, the, re the rewrites that are now being contemplated of the uh, CFA, the, the uh, I forget what, what it stands for, but the Computer, Compu Fraud and Abuse Act, yeah. Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, apparently they're going in the wrong direction. Uh, that our friends in Congress are trying to make it even easier for us to all be felons which that, that, this is terrifying. That, that's, a, that's a case where we just have to, you know, we can't do anything individually. We have to do something collectively or we're screwed. And this is really worrisome. Again, another a, a countermeasure of sorts is to, uh, you know, pick your platforms. Uh, I was the biggest Apple person you, you could find from a long way back. Uh, a, a decade ago, uh, or more at, at when I'd be at a press event, I'd be the only one with a Mac laptop, maybe one of two. John Markoff actually was using him before I was. Um, and I, you know, I was the, a Mac bigot for years, but I started when the, especially when the iPhone, there, were, there was a whole bunch of things that happened, including Apple suing uh, websites that wanted to do journalism about Apple, things like that were, I started to worry. And then the iOS platform and the control freakery that Apple was engaging in there made me worry more. Their fundamental arrogance as a company worried me more. And then they got incredibly big and powerful. And you know, when they were when they were the underdog <laughs> upstart, fine, be a control freak. Nobody's gonna, you know, we have lots of choices. Now that, you know, everybody but me at a press event <laughs> has an has a Mac. I think this is starting to get worrisome. Uh, so I moved away from the iOS and even from the Mac, which is regressing, in my opinion, uh, in its uh, allowance for me to do what I want. This is amazing how the Mac OS is starting to get kind of restrictive. And Apple has good reasons for everything some that are plausible in some ways, like insisting they're, you know, they're moving app developers, application developers into their store, even on the Mac, and saying, you know, you can't, we won't let you sell it unless you sandbox everything, uh, you know, uh, change the way you've done your programming. And there are some reasons for that that aren't bad. There are some things you lose when you do that. I, I want to do what I want with my own computer. Um, there, and all computer makers are moving toward devices that you know, that if, if you, that's actually really hard to open uh, physically. Uh, I'm, I'm absolutely overjoyed with this particular ThinkPad because I can replace damn near anything I want to in here and have. And it, it, it but Lenovo is starting to move toward Apple. Everyone wants to be Apple and that's one of the ways they want to be Apple. Uh, I don't like that. So, you know, on, on if, if you have an Android phone, and uh, I'm not saying you should just root it for the hell of it. Uh, in fact, rooting it makes you vulnerable in other ways. That means, rooting means giving yourself more control. Um, and, but, but there are reasons, and, and there are uh, third party OSs once you do give yourself more control, third party operating systems based on Android that uh, do everything Android does and then let you lock it down again for yourself. You know, if I, I want to be the one who turns the lock, the key in the lock. I don't want them to do it. I, I want to be the one who gets to turn it in, in whichever direction. So that's one platform choice um, that I make whenever I can. I'm, and it's one reason I'm really interested in some of the new mobile <laughs> operating systems that are starting to come along, including the Firefox OS, which I, I I don't know if any of them are going, to, are going to get traction, but they offer the possibility, at any rate, of control back to the user at some level. Um, again, we, th this is uh, trade-offs that we're going to make because there are some apps that will just never work 
on this because of that. Um, an another, this is sort of unrelated in a sense, but um, as we move more of our stuff into other people's cloud applications and on their things, and I, I put this to journalists a lot, why are you pouring your journalism into Facebook when you don't control it anymore? Uh, why are you doing all, you know, what, why are you putting it on other people's platforms? Uh, and the answer, of course, is, well, it's, it's distribution. <laughs> it's uh, attention. We're getting, we're getting people to pay attention to us. And as a, as a promotional tool, fine. But we have to remember that we do things on these free platforms at the sufferance of them. At, the, at their whim, Google Reader demise is an example of this. Uh, you know, if it's, and, and you know the cliche, if, it, if, if you're not paying for it on the web, then you're not the customer, you're the product being sold to advertisers. This is all true and it's increasingly things that we need to individually be aware of and make decisions about. So, I think we all should have a presence on the web, on, on the, in the online world, that is owned by us. <coughs> May not be the place we do most of our work, or even much of it, but I think we, have a, we should have a home base that's ours to the extent we can own anything in this world, uh, in, in the digital world. Uh, and, and it's not total ownership given the way that works, but I, I now, I've been telling students that I'll give them extra credit if they get their own domain name and create a site. I'm not, it, no, it's not, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to make it mandatory to pass the course that they get their own domain name and put something there. I want them to define themselves on their place, not on someone else's. And I think this is something we should all be doing as, as we move forward. And then, you know, I'm, in the project I'm working on the book, I'm, I'm going to try to get people, no matter what platform they use, to do the stuff that's easy and doable on all platforms. And then kind of go in a kind of a gradient of difficulty or hassle or trade-off to, you know, what's the most you can do. And, uh, you know, right now Linux is, is the last bastion of operating system freedom. Uh, and... I've made the switch to Linux uh, a year ago, and I've had it, it's been almost painless. Uh, it's really finally gotten ready for prime time. Now there's still hassles. If you, no one should ever have to use the command line if they don't want to, uh, and Linux is not perfect on that. You, there are still times I have to type, you know, apt, get, and things that you know, normal human beings don't want to do and shouldn't have to. But even there, it's improving. And, and, and uh, I don't care which distribution of the major ones you use, it's, they're actually all pretty good. I, I personally use Ubuntu. Uh, but even there, uh, they're starting to be some control freak stuff going on. And, and Mark Shuttleworth, who I admire enormously, I think is making some uh, decisions that I would not make myself. So who knows? I may be on just plain BSD one of these days. But the this it's it's I used to tr I've tried Linux every year for uh, more than a decade, waiting for it to be ready for prime time. I think it's ready. Doesn't solve the issue of preloading. Most people want it just to work with the thing they bought, uh, and Microsoft has made new initiatives to make that hard. Uh, I won't describe them in detail, but there's a whole lockdown thing going on with Microsoft. Again, there's some security reasons for it that are not wrong, but that are, uh, you know, it's not a coincidence that it's really screwing up the Linux community at the same time. That, that's a benefit. That's a feature, as far as Microsoft is concerned, that it makes Linux hard to use. That's a feature. It's, you know, in my world, it's a bug. Uh, so these are the, some of the things. Um, that's, that's where I'm heading, um, and I really do want to make clear, I'm not going to be accusing people of evil, off, at least not often, in this thing. I, pe there are some evil things being do done, but you know, there's, it's always, always about self-interest. 
almost always anyway. But I want to, I want to move these back together. Um, I don't think we're ever going to get them to be completely concentric, but I think we can get a lot closer again, and I hope we will. Um, that and that's where all of you and and anyone who's listening to the webcast now or forever um, are actually. By the way, my rule of thumb on the forever part of the web is that anything that you uh, absolutely need to have and that you will be in trouble if, if it disappears, you must relentlessly back it up yourself in, in many different ways uh, because the minute something goes wrong, it will, it will, be, it will disappear forever. Anything that's, that could possibly embarrass, embarrass you will live forever with no intervention on your part. So keep that in mind. Okay. I need your help. Um, this is the, you know, I've, I've made a little website for it. Uh, the title, the working title is Permission Taken. Um, probably the title since I, now I'm using this domain. Um, my, even my agent likes the title, so that, that's a good, uh, but I, I suspect because I always do Creative Commons in my work that uh, this will end up being a uh, uh, self-published book, at least here. Um, anyway, this is the uh, this is the talk, and, and this is again. I'm I'm I, I've been thinking about this hard for about a year, and now I'm sort of jumping in and pushing ahead. Uh, and I really do need your help and thinking about where to go with it. But uh, so th this is Q and A. But I hope to hear a lot of A from all of you as well. Um, so uh, with that, uh, any. One? Thank you. The yes, sir. The logic, uh, the logic that started with that you should have your own domain, it would seem like what would have to follow if you really want to avoid the problems you're talking about is that you have to you know, host, you have to have your own machine, do all, do all of your own hosting, uh, run your own Apache server, <coughs> so basically become a, become a system in, uh, in addition to your, your regular job. Um, if that's not if that's not necessary, how do you avoid becoming dependent on some external service? You, you cannot avoid being dependent on some external service unless you want to do that. I, again, I'm, all of this is about, you know, there's, there's a, a slider yeah. here uh, of, that we're going to have to make choices. I have my, my hosting is done by someone I know personally uh, who, whom I trust. And I, I don't have a good answer for that. I, I think the, one of the things that, that's really needed and is, is not, as far as I know, widely available is uh, systematic and universal encryption in the cloud so that whoever is storing your stuff actually can't muck with it unless you give them permission. Um, that now, that raises legal questions for them, but at least I, I think we have to move in that direction for for any of this to be working. Uh, yes. Um, thanks. Um, I, I really like what you're saying. Um, I'm not a specialist, and as a non-specialist, it sounds to me like uh, a conversation among a very small number of people who are real, um, very. Uh, who aren't just interested, but are really refined specialists in this area. And so my interest is how to get this out and have it be more accessible and broadly understood. And that leads me to wonder about schools mm -hmm. and literacy in schools. Could this be included in basic media and, and telecommunications literacy in all our public schools? On the one hand, yeah. On the other hand, I, I worry that it's a, there's a kind of individualism at its core that you can figure it out, you get to do it, nobody else can figure it out, they don't get to do it, and they're at the mercy of all this, mm -hmm. and how do we build um, a, a default position that protects individuals who can't develop yeah. specialized knowledge? Okay. Uh, let, let me repeat for those who may not have heard, um, at least try and get the, the gist of it, uh, that 
a lot of this sounds like it's for uh, geeks. And, uh, you know, as a proud semi-geek, um, I worry that that's true. And, and how, do we, how do we achieve, uh, how do we first of all get people to understand this better? Um, and uh, I'll answer that partly that I said I, I'm not aiming this at my friends uh, who are geeks. I'm, I'm aiming it at, I think I'm aiming it at my students um, who have grown up and thinking that Facebook is the internet. And that a, a Mac Air, MacBook Air, is a computer that gives them absolute freedom. Uh, you know, neither of which are true. So, and and again, that's why I'm going to my my, my where, where I'm aiming in in this book or whatever this is. Uh, early chapters are what you can do no matter what you use that are things that are relatively easy to do that will help. It won't solve the problem. And I'm and and try and take people kind of a uh, uh, you know on a ramp on a ramp hopefully accelerating uh, I don't I don't have a good metaphor here but finding a way to get them as far as they are personally comfortable with going and in really clear language I hope that will demystify this stuff although a lot of it still mystifies me uh, and then. The, your idea about getting this as part of a media literacy, technical literacy uh, part of schools, I think is a really fine idea and that we, we should be encouraging that. My last book was about media literacy in this di digital world and um, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, uh, what's the project in New York about? Uh, hmm? No, no, I'm talking. No, no, I'm talking about the the coding one, Code Academy. Um, Code Academy, where you you can learn programming skills, and and uh, Douglas Rushkoff, uh, a friend of many of us, wrote a wonderful book called Program or Be Programmed, uh, that gets to this issue. I think you know programming. Some simple programming should be a basic literacy for everybody. Not because we're all going to be programmers, but because we un need to un understand how software works. Um, I, I, you know, I, I feel like I'm in the same place I was with the beginning of the last book, which is because the last book was aimed at not the supply side of, of journalism and information, but the demand side a lot harder. This is a demand side issue. I have no illusions that it's going to be big demand anytime soon. But I hope people will start to see A, what's at risk, and B, what they're losing. And also recognizing what they gain by being locked down. And there are gains to being locked down that I have to acknowledge. But yes, I, I'd, I'd love to see schools get into this, but you know, I'm, you know, this is the United States. And I'd love to see schools get into a lot of things that they don't even touch. Uh, let me go to, to here, and then there, and then here. Thank you so much. For Speak time. loudly, please. I'm uh, hard, well, I'm hard sure. of hearing. I'll try to talk loudly. Uh, so at the beginning of your talk, you were saying that you know, in the early days of the internet, the, uh, the freedom and convenience aspects were kind of merged together in that Venn diagram, and now they're moving apart. Um, and you hinted at some of the factors that led to that change, um, one of them being self-interest and desire for security, information, power, convenience, and so forth. And on the other side, what's bringing them back together seems to be things like the uh, educational literacy that the previous gentleman was asking about, as well as the rise of uh, technologies and software like Ubuntu. Um, so looking into the future, do you feel like this trend will reverse, or will it continue that freedom and convenience will go further apart? And what are the major factors in how we understand this? Well, I, I, think, I think the, uh, if you throw everything on, on, on scales where, you know, good direction, bad direction, I think the bad direction one is still getting heavier than, than the good one. Um, that's why I'm doing this. I, I'm, you know, I'm hoping to throw a few weights into the good side 
um, and with, under no illusion that I can reverse this or that, uh, that, that it's going to reverse any time <coughs> soon. But I think that we have to do what we can. Um, and I, I think people are, are just sim I, I, I don't think people are generally aware of what the issues are. I think that's the first thing. And it will help the more we can get the word out about what's, what's going on and what's at stake. And that I, if people want to make choices that I don't agree with based on knowledge, I'll live with that. I'll keep doing what I can to be to do things my way. But you know, I also live in a country that has that that now uh, goes through machines that basically do these you know strip searches and your hands up in the air like you're a criminal about to be frisked completely willingly with no indication of whether at least some of them are safe. That, you know, I don't call that a good trend either. I, I think we have been trading convenience for the illusion of security for a long time. Uh, and, and the illusion, of, and it, it's, we have to, we, I think we just do what we can. But right now it's not going the right way. Uh, in, Level, the most important thing to add more weight to the good side is awareness. Well, the, I think that'll help, but keep, you know, there's more money on the control side, more power on the control side. This is a, you know, every major institution from government to, to powerful corporations is aligned on fundamentally the same side of this, which is re-centralizing the technology that promised radical decentralization and all of the benefits that would come from that. That's a problem. Again, we're going to, I don't know, I'm going to try to convince people to use stuff that doesn't do that to them to the extent possible, have better policies, but start with the individual for now. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, thank you for the presentation. I thought it was great. I'm not, a, I'm not even a semi-geek, but I'm, I'm wondering, what are the risks? What do you, I'm not, I'd like to hear more about exactly what, what are you concerned about? I mean, I'm not, a, I feel free to do anything I want on the internet. Maybe people are monitoring me. Maybe the government is. Marketeers surely are. I'm, I'm concerned about hackers, surely. I don't want my identity stolen. But what are the risks? Well, some, let me, let me, let me address that in two ways. First of all, the same vulnerabilities that give hackers inroads are used in, in a pretty, they're used by people you think are okay in, in some ways. The, um, I, I, but at a more, I have a more philosophical problem with this, and that is I, I think a society that's under pervasive surveillance is a deadened society in the long run. I think, I think that's a, uh, I, I, I think that that whole process is, is bad for us in, in every way that I can imagine, except one, which is the possibility of stopping a certain am amount of crime. But you know, in dictatorships, the chief criminals are the government um, and, and the police. So it's, it's not like you, you get a, you know, it doesn't solve the problem. Um, and if we, going to the, the, you know, the FBI wants a back door into every technology. I promise you, if they have one, it's going to be used by bad people. Even within their organizations and the fact that you've created a vulnerability deliberately, it's, this, this stuff doesn't stay secret forever. That others will find it and use it. That the more you, the more you unharden the defenses, the more room there is for bad, really bad actors to get in. So there, there are a lot of different reasons, but I'm, those are some of the key ones. Uh, over here, yes. Talk a little bit about how Tor can help protect whistleblowers. Can you, can you speak a little louder, Tor? Sorry. How Tor can help. <laughs> You talked about how Tor can help protect people who are whistleblowers, and I'm curious if you have other 
advice for journalists about how to do that? And then if you had a chapter yeah. for journalists about things they're doing every day that they realize they're doing. Um, I did a chapter of a of a multi-author book that's coming out this spring about journalists and and closed platforms. Didn't address security that much, except to say that journalists need to really learn about security and 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 do so right away because they're uh, they're threatening the lives of their sources if they don't in in places where lives are in jeopardy, and they're threatening their sources in other ways. Um, and themselves, especially in an environment where journalism is under attack around the world. Uh, the Committee to Protect Journalists in particular has done uh, really important work on helping uh, journalists understand what the risks are and to mitigate them. And it's a, it's a crucial issue, and it's one that uh, I don't think has gotten enough attention inside the craft uh, because it's it you know I know it just from from when I was there it was you know I was the only one who under who had even heard of PGP um, although I have to say I had my PGP fingerprint on my column at the bottom of it for six years and got two emails as a result of it that were encrypted, one of which said, I just want to see if this works. Uh, so you know, it's not like our sources are just you know, ready to jump. But yeah, I, I, increasingly journalists are, you know, who really are appropriate, appropriately paranoid in, in the right situations are, are learning not to use technology if they can avoid it. Um, and by the way, this the security thing is is a it's shifting ground. It's you have you, you can't prepare for every possible risk. You just can't un, without doing extraordinary measures for the most severe ones. I take for granted if the United States government, in its all powerful ways, wants to find out what I'm talking about online, they're going to find a way to do it. If nothing else, they're going to find a way to get my computer when I'm not at it and, and install a keylogger. That's, you know, or break into my house and put up cameras. If they really want to surveil me, they're going to find a way. But like the better deadbolt lock on your house will stop, you know, amateur, cr amateur uh, criminals, and not, not the dedicated ones who know how to hack a lock, there, you know, you prepare your best for the situations you're likeliest to see. So I'm, you know, I'm reasonably careful. I'm, as an example, and the journalist could, this is an example possibly for journalists. When I do my online banking, I do it from a virtual machine that has one purpose only that's inside of this computer. It has one purpose only, and that's <laughs> online banking. That's it. It has never ever gone to any other place on the internet that I'm aware of, that virtual machine. I don't think that's totally paranoid. I think that's a, it, it's not that you're going to lose all your money unless, you know, businesses have a bigger risk than individuals. But again, prepare for the risk appropriately, but not, you can't be comprehensive about the worst you, you adjust thing, and journalists have to understand all that. Um, you, sir, and then and then Harry. You've talked a little bit about this. There's a wider context, and I think perhaps you want the online part of this. But you've also had a recent court case, which I think was knocked down, where uh, corporations were saying, "You can't resell our stuff. Mm. We still own it if we have a copyright on it." And I believe that that was knocked down. Yeah. There's, there is a rise of corporate feudalism and corporate branding where it seems that late stage capitalism wants to own their market, literally own their yeah. market the way that barons own serfs. <laughs> and this is, this is offline as well as online. And it's <laughs> governments and corporations and sometimes yeah. shadowy combinations thereof 
there, so there's a wider context of this, and I'm wondering how much of that wider context do you actually want to get into, because I think it will inform what you're talking about. And one, and one last thing. There's an idea in, in the right wing about sovereign citizenry. I'm perpetuating a meme. The only sovereign citizens are corporate citizens. And I think that may be a stalking horse. Actually, it was a stalking horse for, for corporate feudalism. The only sovereign citizens are corporate citizens. Um, these, are, these are good points. And I, the, the copyright case you're talking about was a uh, someone, uh, you, you know, publishers sell books and other material at different prices in different parts of the world um, because they then they basically getting what the market will bear, supply and demand. So people in Thailand can uh, can't pay on average as much for a book as they can pay here. So someone bought a book in Thailand and brought it back and sold it in the U.S. and the copyright cartel and the publisher arm of it said, this is illegal because we, we say so. And there's a right of first sale in the US. And they said, it doesn't, doesn't apply to something you buy outside. Now, if the Supreme Court had upheld that, the immediate result would have been the trans, uh, the, the offshoring of every, of manufacturing of every uh, media product there was. That would have been in the f immediate result. Because then they could say, you can't resell your book where you can clearly under a book made here. Anyway, the Supreme Court wisely, in my view, said, you know, that's, that's nuts. You, won't, you, you bought the thing, you can sell it. Um, you know, you click in a, you, 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 you do an agreement when you buy a piece of software with most companies that you cannot resell it, although that's, you know, not widely, try, they don't try to enforce that much, except in, unless they know it's running on two systems and you're buying a license for things, and that's what you're getting at. The, uh, there, here's two things. One is that in, as we move forward, everything we buy, physical good that we buy, not everything, but increasingly so, every physical good is going to have a component called software. Because we're, in, we're, in, we're embedding processing, memory, and often connectivity into physical goods at a very rapid rate. So that leaves an op that's an opportunity for the control crowd to exert control and not let you own anything that you buy. And, and by the way, that's growing more powerful. Uh, in Massachusetts, the, car de the, the people who fix cars, who are, who are not dealers, got a ballot measure, I believe it was in, uh, approved, saying, saying you, you can't you, the, your software machine on wheels can be fixed by anybody, and therefore you have to provide access to the software to anybody. That's a marvelous thing, and I'm sure you're going to talk about that uh, as, an, as an analog to this, because actually it's less and less of an analogy, but more and more of the reality. So that, yes. But we, we have to, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm making common cause on this thing with some friends on the political right uh, who, uh, we, we have, in, in this, this is a space where uh, some of the more uh, far-seeing people on the right are uh, ahead, far ahead of most people on the left. A guy named Derek Khanna, who David knows, and I know who used to be working for the Republican Congress and got fired for daring to tell the truth about copyright. Oh, right. um, Okay, I, I saw Derek over the weekend, and we talked a lot about this stuff. And he's he's uh, he, he's one of the people I don't agree with on anything <laughs> except this. And you know what? I will make uh, I, I I will be an ally of anybody on the stuff I care about, no matter what crazy stuff they think on things that I may also care about, but that I don't agree on. I, I, we can be out. Let me, let me get to some other questions. Harry. Uh, great project. Congratulations for doing it. Um, here's, the, here's your problem. I, th I think the most important question. I knew Harry would <laughs> the most pour question, water on this. <laughs> no, the most, most important question that was asked is, what are you worried about? OK? Because we're dealing in a, in a 
different kind of surveillance society than the one that we're used to thinking about, where people know that they're being surveilled, right? We're kind of at the opposite extreme from the panopticon thing where everybody is frightened because everybody knows that they might be surveilled all the time. Until these breaches, the consequences become evident to the individual, their bank account suddenly is taken, has had $10,000 taken out of it without their recognizing, they're not going to go to the trouble of, you know, setting up a VM just for their, just for their online banking. <coughs> and the incentive system for the people who are doing the surveillance is to do it as unobtrusively as possible yeah. so that you will so that you will <laughs> never never notice that the average person going through their life will never never notice even in the commercial marketing thing because people get weirded out when you know and so there there I think the and on the commercial side there's going to be more and more incentives not to be so aggressive that you notice the kind of surveillance that's happening mm -hmm. and the problem comes that you will never know why your life insurance premium is a hundred dollars higher than mine or vice versa right you will never know what the data paths were that led to that and you will you will never know that it not only why it is but that it is because mm -hmm. the, the 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 surveillance will be happening at a level that is completely invisible to the individual and as long as it's individual invisible to the individual you know that, that, that you know you can put scary stories about what's probably happening to all of us but i you're going to have a hard time making people wake up i think that's the real challenge for all of us i'm not just critiquing your book but it's you know it's this this whole world that we're living in so so you know you said you said a, a surveilled society is a deadened society but only if people know that they're being surveilled if they don't believe they're being surveilled because they see no evidence of it their behavior isn't going to change. So he's, he's, he's telling them. Yeah, he's telling them. Well, he's telling them. Yes, tell, I know that. It, 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 telling, the telling people they're, that, that, that they're being surveilled is, as Harry says, they say, yeah, right, that's okay. And, and, but if, nothing, if they don't, if see, they don't any, see anything happening. If they don't see a consequence, right. then, uh, and, and this is, but we, you know, also, I, I'm just we telling all, you what your challenge is. I'm not, I, I, I'm not, I'm not I don't, saying you're wrong in any I, way. I don't disagree. As somebody else said, this is not an original thought. If you had told us a, 20, a generation ago, if, if, if the government a generation ago had said, you will henceforth carry with you a tracking device right. that we can, that where we can see where you are at any time, right. <laughs> there would have been, you know, a bit of an uproar. Guess what? We did it voluntarily. Uh, one of the countermeasures, incidentally, that I want to do, I, you know, you can't stop the, you, I mean, the, the cell tower has to know where you are. I'd like to find a way to spoof everything else for everyone else um, and, and basically uh, notify these app developers that I'm going to, I'm, you know, they want, they think they know where I am. Uh, don't use this data. It's wrong. I, I think that's actually a better countermeasure than just blocking it. But, but tell them, you know, I'm sending you data back, but actually I'm really not in Kathmandu today. I, but you're not, I'm not going to tell you exactly where. So things like that. Uh, but again, it doesn't solve the problem Harry raises and he's right. Um, I mean, I mean, that's what happened here with the email. Hmm blow up, right? I mean, at some level, everybody knew, but at some yeah. level, nobody well, cared until it didn't, until it's... No, no one employed by anyone else should assume their email is not being read on their, on the employer's server, period. End of, end of story. I don't care. Um, here, here, and there. Okay. Hey, really and then there. Presentation. Thank you so much. Um, uh, another comment, mostly, what I worry about, um, you know, I, I think these are all great things, and, you know, we should all do them, clearly. Um, but what I worry about creating is a privacy of the elite. So that is a, a privacy that only certain people can access, leaving large segments of our population and our communities behind. And I think that that creates a very dangerous, dangerous scenario. If I have access and the skills and ability and time and resources to make sure that my computer is safe and private, but maybe the person next to me doesn't, or you know, others in my community 
should there be government regulations mm -hmm. in order yeah. to make sure that we're all operating within the same level of privacy? Um, and what's the answer there? The it's it's a completely important point, and we. I don't know about making rules, but because the government rules won't be the ones you like. Um, we, I think we can be assured of that for the most part. Um, but the, 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 the haves and haves nots in this case are, are this is a real issue. Um, one of the things we all have to do is, is create a market. You know, the, I, I want, there needs to be, I want to say, I, I look for, I would hope for a market based solution to this because markets do work better than than advice or edicts um, and I, I a friend of mine is actually working on a mobile hardware s startup I can't say anything more about it that will address some of these on the mobile side uh, but with a fundamental thought about separating uh, layers in, in various software stacks from each other to think about, to really deal with this at a basic, at basic level. Uh, I, I'm, you know, I'll be his third customer. Uh, but, you know, because I want to, I want to try it. I want to help. Uh, but yeah, we got to find a way to make stuff available to people. And again, I'm, I, I, we haven't seen a much of a marketplace for privacy. But, I mean, so and, if it's a marketplace solution, isn't the iPhone and the lockdown Mac, aren't that what the market is? Well, it's a part of the market wants. And by the way, the iPhone is more secure in certain ways by far than all but the most recent Android releases in its sandboxing of applications. It's, it's, it's separating them so one can't muck with another, things like that. It's, there, there are elements of the iPhone that are extremely secure and better secure in terms of that level of what you do than, than the other stuff on the market. I'm not, you know, I'm only against Apple's bad stuff, not their good <laughs> stuff. Um, but, yeah, we haven't, again, and this goes to Harry's point, I don't think enough people are, are scared enough yet uh, because they, you know, otherwise, you know, when people get scared, there is a market. Uh, right now, not yet. Let's, we have to end fairly soon. Let's make it kind of a lightning round of, uh, there was a question. Why don't we go to the, you, and then you had a question. So we'll make it a lightning round. Ask a really quick question, and so we'll, in order, and then I will answer as much of it as I can at the end. So the ACLU is basically it's raised on debt, but it's on issues similar to privacy, privacy, and a couple of other issues. And they do put out pamphlets like what to do if the FBI contacts you, what to do if you're stopped by a policeman. And I don't see why they couldn't be uh, groups couldn't be formed to advise them in creating pamphlets that at least would reach one level yeah. of actively involved citizens and then it might filter down from there mm -hmm. or should filter down yeah. from there as in these other cases. So okay. that's just a thought. Yes. So much of hacker culture and open source culture is based on being elite and things being yeah. difficult to use. Um, a lot of the privacy tools that we have work pretty well. It's that no one can take the time to use them. There's a distinct lack of design in these things, and in not just that it's difficult to move from something beautiful like a like an Apple product to something that is clunky, like Linux has stopped being quite so much lately. Um, but also that we don't see things that are poorly designed as legitimate. Okay. And that's that's a fairly easy fix if you just bring in more designers. Great point. Yes. I uh, just wanted to ask real quick about the generational shift we're seeing that that. You know, younger people don't actually seem to care that much about privacy and are willing to put stuff out, out on Facebook that, you know, older folks would never dream of putting in the public domain. Good. Another point. Yes. And you can, so there, okay. Two more here. Okay. Um, there are some of those resources out there uh, that try to teach people how to use how to use these tools excessively. So CryptoParty.org has a lot of resources. We and other groups run crypto parties here in Boston, Louisiana, the Massachusetts Pirate Party, um, and all around the world to bring people to a basic level of understanding. Um, I, questions, to what extent do you worry about, in addition to all of the chilling effects that you would have if people know they're being surveilled, mm -hmm. as another anxiety to have in a society where people don't know they're being surveilled, the way that shifts power between an individual and the firms or governments who have their data 
and have the social science or other levers to manipulate them. Yeah. And if social media, second question, if social media are a huge lure getting people to reveal things about themselves, <laughs> are there alternatives to the mediated social media that are ready for prime time? Okay. My question is uh, fairly basic. Uh, much of your discussion while acknowledging the need to uh, build a, uh, a better market for, pro uh, for privacy uh, work, and uh, I do firmly believe that there's a number of privacy-related uh, uh, software and other things available that are just not being, being found. But um, a lot of a lot of the, your discussion was a little bit dismay at uh, the uh, substantial interests against it in uh, in uh, the government, the law, uh, general mm -hmm. laws, and the marketplace. I just want to know if you would uh, had any thoughts about about ways to actually use these mechanisms to to promote your aspirations? We've seen a lot of progress uh, under the banner of protected children as far as what. Um, what any website that's uh, yeah. okay. quote unquote directed towards kids can and cannot do, and I was wondering if, there, if you thought there was any ways of uh, of uh, broadening this. Okay, I'll start with the last question. I'm going to rename this Protect the Children, <laughs> and then everyone will do what I want. <laughs> um, good idea. Um, but, yeah, that, that you can get the worst laws passed by right. claiming you're about to protect the children. Um, the uh, going first question, there, there are things out there, uh, you just heard one about uh, Crypto Party, uh, which for all its attempts to be non-geeky is still pretty geeky, and but a great start. But there are these uh, meetings people have. It's a start. It's a wonderful start and needs to get even easier. That which also is addressing another question. The ease of use is not there yet for this stuff and needs to be. Um, the, the, the other problem is that you, to, to get these privacy add-ons, you often have to buy them. Uh, and to get, to, to, and all that free stuff, free in quotes, which has a cost, you, people don't want to know or don't care. Um, the, um, the generational shift, two things on that. One is that we are, th this is absolutely the case that younger people are putting stuff out into the wild that w we, in my generation, would not have done. There's only, there are really two possibilities for the future. Uh, one is my hope that we are all going to start cutting each other more slack, uh, which I've written about before, and that, uh, that, you know, that everyone will recognize that we all did unbelievably stupid, even possibly criminal things when we were in our 20s, and fine. How, who are you today? And by the way, I still do plenty of stupid things. I, I think I've you know left the criminal stuff behind. But the, um, but, but you know if we don't cut each other slack, we're we're kind of screwed on that basis. But what worries me is that our society at le some level is more tolerant today than it was. But you know societies change and they grow less tolerant too. This could be there could be this could be catastrophic for a bunch of people if our society goes the way that the right wing, for example, would like it to go. And that's not out of the question. So there, we, you know, people may learn this the hard way, and there's not much we can do. Um, the last one, uh, before we have to stop. Um, no, we got that. The power shift. The power shift, yeah. Um, man, I... Yes, the, this, that's the basis of this, is that the power is being pulled back from the, uh, from the edges where the best innovation in the last 50 years has gone, or 25 anyway, back to the center, where innovation does happen, but at a very different pace and in a very different way. Uh, and I'm a resistor, but yes, that's where that's what's happening, and and you know I I think that has consequences for for us in our in in the long term that are not positive when that happens. But you know, it's e speculating on what consequences will be is is never as persuasive as demonstrating what they are now. The problem, but that's part of our society. We never think very far ahead. 
Um, I, I don't, you know, I, do I have answers? You know, not particularly. I could use some help on this. But, you know, I'm, I, I want the power in, to be in this room and wherever you go from here. I, I don't want it to stay in this room or, or in, in the Capitol or in, uh, you know, Armonk, New York or in uh, Palo Alto. I, I want it to be distributed, and I don't have. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm pretty worried. But I'm, you know, I'm kind of a relentless optimist, or I would not do the stuff I do in general. So, uh, you know, if we don't try, we're not going to get very far. That's that's my uh, trite closing remark. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>